basic functionality. Now that we have been introduced into the scripting environment, we can look at how to more effectively use the tools at our disposal. Alternatively to the previous example, we can access the same information by typing the following. Mesh equals data model dot mesh data by name and then in the brackets insert global. Then we will input mesh dot element count. As expected, the output is the same as the previous code. We have also reused the variable name mesh. In this case, we have changed what that variable means. In this code, I am accessing the mesh data directly. And if you look at the previous example, I accessed the mesh information from the static structural branch. By doing the same thing in two ways, you can see how powerful the API is to move vertically into different branches of the structure tree. Now that you have been introduced to the shell and script editor, I would like to go over the absolute basic data types in Python that you will need to know. First, we have strings, which are like words and are inserted in inverted commas. We have integers, abbreviated as int. These are typically used for indexing in lists. Naturally, it makes sense to demonstrate the integers and lists together. So I will make a list. A list is defined with square brackets and elements of that list are separated with commas. Any data type can be inserted within the list, including another list. To access the elements of the list, we will return the list and its index specified with a square bracket as an integer. The key thing in Python is that indexing always starts at zero. Indexing is used very often in the mechanical API for a variety of applications, so just be aware of that. We also have floats, which are effectively all numbers used for mathematical operations. Then you get Boolean operators, which are effectively true and false statements. Everything I have just explained is a very crude explanation, and to understand this better, you will need to dig a bit deeper into Python. I can't go into too much detail or this video will take too long. So again, I refer you to the references in the video description. Before we move on, I would like to just go into more detail on the most important aspects we have touched on, which is the autocomplete tool and navigating through mechanical with the API. If we look at the autocomplete tool, not only does it give us a list of our available options, but it also gives us information on those options. When you look at the autocomplete list, we can scroll through the options with our mouse or use the up and down keys on our keyboard. Next to the available options, further details are given, such as the required input information and what the output will return. The type of data it will return and is required is also highlighted. Some options even have example code to look at. When using the autocomplete, certain words are highlighted in different colors by the tooltip. Green is for accessibility, purple is the type of data, orange is a warning, and blue is an argument. There is a lot to cover if we go into the details on the data types and how the API works, so unfortunately, you will need to do some digging of your own if you want more information on this. I will again refer you to the documentation for more information on data types. If you need more information on something, you can always type help and the argument you need help with, and it will give you a printout of the help for that object. For example, we can type help data model and as you can see, the output information is given in the shell. Another useful feature of the autocomplete is to check if your code is working. This is seen when you type in something and put a period, and the autocomplete gives you additional options. If not, it may need additional information, or you might have made a mistake in your code. The next topic I think is of the utmost importance is navigating in mechanical using the API. In the previous examples, we accessed the data model. This is important and will be used often because essentially 
This is where all the data is stored for the tree. That is a very crude explanation, but to keep it simple, you can think of it in that way. The tree can be accessed directly from the API. For example, I will click on a branch of the tree and then we can type in tree.activeObject. This will then return the branch of the tree we are currently in. We can also filter our tree based on some criteria. For example, I can suppress one of the blocks and then type tree.filter and then state equals object state dot suppressed. This will then show in the tree all of the suppressed objects. I should highlight at this point that the API uses indexes to retrieve objects and because it is Python, indexing starts at zero. To work in the static structural analysis, we can go, but accessing an index does not always make sense, so we can instead access the same thing by using analysis by name. This indexing works the same for bodies and parts and almost anything within the tree and elements within the branches. For example, I can access the connections using the connection name, or I can access the connections by using an index. I can then access additional information or add objects like a beam or spring to this connections variable. In this case, I would just like to see the first contact region type. I can do this by typing the following. Now, the next question that probably came to mind is how can I change these properties and values? The answer is not as simple as you may think. Some values are easy to change and others are slightly more complex, as we will see with boundary conditions. This is a more clear-cut example where we can change the contact type and we can do it by typing the following. Now, if you check in the tree, we have gone and made a frictionless contact instead of a bonded. Now that you have been introduced into the scripting interface and have a basic understanding of how the autocomplete tool works and how to navigate using the API, we can look at some useful code.